what we I'll go back. What we finished about yesterday was we introduced this TCP/IP protocol stack or protocol architecture. It is the set of layers that we'll use when we talk about the internet and data communications. We had a, an example yesterday. We spoke about how to greet someone and we illustrated what a protocol was. Basically a set of rules that the entities follow to communicate. And of course we need to define the message format. So the rules that the entities follow, the people, the computers, and the messages that they exchange. And we said that instead of trying to solve one pro or the, the problem of data communications with a single protocol or a single piece of software, we break it into subtasks. And the way that we uh, conceptualize these subtasks is in layers. That is, we have one layer that is responsible for one set of tasks. And below that, another layer that is responsible for a different set of tasks, and so on. And we combine those layers together, and the protocols in those layers, and we get a protocol stack or a protocol architecture. Where the layers contain protocols related to that set of tasks, but it may they may contain multiple protocols. And one example, or the, the example that we're going to use for this course, is this protocol architecture which has five layers and within the layers there are many different protocols perform different tasks related to transmitting signals across links making sure those that data that's transmitted is successfully transmitted and delivered the network layer making sure that the data cannot get not just across one link but across many links across a network make sure the data can, can get from applications in a reliable manner and then protocols that are specific to applications so depending upon the application you're using what we're going to do this morning is go through another example but this time a real example of how one protocol works and try and illustrate some more parts of this protocol architecture and the example is a, a very simple one it's something you use every day it's web browsing so what I'm going to do is, I'll show you in a moment, but we'll open a web browser, visit a website, and what I want to do is see the protocols involved in that data communications. So from the user's point of view, I'm going to visit a website, and the information I'm going to get is a web page, or the content of that web page. So that's the user's perspective. But what happens in terms of when my laptop sends some data and receives some data, what protocols are being used and uh, what are the structure of the messages being sent and a few other new things that we'll introduce through the example. So this will take a bit of time so let's, let's follow along. Uh, the example, I think on a later slide there's some picture if we skip through some of these slides, slide 25 or 26 We'll come back to these. Example of TCP IP operation is basically what we're going to do now. So you don't need to take many, draw any pictures. Uh, how does web browsing work? Very simple view of web browsing. There's a web browser and a web server. Pieces of software running on different computers normally. What this diagram shows is some exchange of messages between a web browser this line and the web server. So let's say we have two computers somewhere on the internet. My laptop and a web server somewhere. I want to, what I do is I open up my web browser and I type in some URL, some address, and press enter or I click on a link. So that's, that's step one. As a result of doing that, my web browser needs to send a message to the server the server identified by the address I typed in. If I type in the address www.facebook.com, my web browser should send a message to the web server represented, representing facebook.com. Okay. It sends some message to the web, web server, and the, the basic format of that message is a, a string, a 
some text that says get some page, get some HTML page or get some image. So that's the uh, commonly used in HTTP is that we get some file. This message, we'll call it a request, is sent to the web server. When this web server receives such a request, they check, does the file exist on their computer, on their hard drive? Is it on the server? If so, and everything's okay, they have permission to access it, the web server opens the file that the browser has requested and sends the contents of that file back in a response. If it's a HTML file, then the contents may look something like this, some HTML code, the marker, <coughs> and some, maybe some status message. So this is the request message. Server sends back a response containing the contents of a file requested in some response message. When my browser receives this, it checks the response code and takes the HTML that was included in the response and uses it to display something on my screen, on my browser. It shows the title at the top of the browser and the contents on the screen. So that's the very basics of web browsing. And this is the protocol used for this is HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. For transferring hypertext, HTML, from a server to a browser. To do that, there's not just one message sent from my computer to the server. The, the H HTTP is an application level protocol. So all this diagram shows is the exchange used at the application layer. But there are other protocol protocols used by my computer at the other layers. We'll see that at the transport layer, there's a protocol called TCP being used to deliver the request between the computers. At the network layer, IP is used, the internet protocol, to make sure that the request gets from my computer to the destination web server. At the data link layer, from my laptop, there's some wireless LAN protocol being used because I'm using wireless LAN to talk to the access point. And same at the physical layer, there's some wireless LAN protocol for transmitting a radio signal at some frequency out of my laptop. So in fact, there are many protocols used to get this request from my computer to the server and get the response back. We want to see which ones are used and see the relationship between them. So what I'm going to do first is create a web page on a server. And the server I'll use is the IT server. So what I'm going to do is the web browser will be my laptop, and the web server will be the IT server. I'm currently in a terminal on my uh, laptop. I'm going to use SSH, like some of you did for the to get your password, and connect to the IT server. You may have used PuTTY or PuTTY in Windows to do the same thing, but uh, I'm on a, a terminal in Linux. Let's hope this works. Provide my password, some warning message, and now I'm logged in to the IT server. So everything I type now is being executed not on my laptop, but on the IT server. And the IT server is a computer downstairs on the third floor, okay, in the computer center. So now I'm running commands on the IT server. Same as what you did when you logged in. Because I'm an administrator of this server, I can change the website. In this directory, slash var, slash www, there is a set of files that are shown here. There's an index.html file, test, fav icon, putty.html, some images, some PNG images, a Moodle directory. This is the web directory for the IT server. When you visit the IT website, let's go back to my browser. If 
when I type into my web browser it.sittuact.h slash index.html, that gets the index.html from the IT server and displays it on my browser. In other words, it gets this file, the contents of this file, index.html. I'm going to, get, going to create a new file. And I, you cannot do this, but I can because I'm the administrator of the server. And nano is just a text editor. Let's call it cs.html. I'm going to create a new web page on the server just for this test. And I'll just put some simple HTML in there. Everyone's created web pages before, either by hand or using some editor. Create the title and some body. So that's the web page that's now going to be stored on the server. And in a moment, I'm going to use my browser to view that web page. Just some HTML. Save that. And the file now exists, cs.html. So that's now available on the web IT web server. Anyone who visits the IT web server and types in slash cs.html will see that web page. And that's what I'm going to do. I'll exit from the IT server. I'm back on the laptop now. But what I want to do is see what my computer does to access the web server. So what's going to happen, I'll open my browser, type in the URL, cs.html. It will send a request to the server downstairs. The server will send back a response. I would like to look at those messages being sent. I cannot, well it's not easy to look at them. I need to run some special software on my computer to capture those messages being sent. Okay? Because it's being sent by the web browser, by the operating system, by my wireless LAN card, as a normal user I cannot see the messages being sent through the computer. We need some special software to, software to do that, to, to capture the messages sent by my computer. And so what I'm going to do now is start this special software that captures everything that my computer sends and receives. The software is called TCP Dump. In, and there's another piece of software that uses this, and you can install this other one yourself. It's called Wireshark. I'll show you in a moment. But what it does is it records everything that your computer sends and receives across the network and allows you to look at that. I need some options. I need to tell it to capture everything using my wireless LAN interface. My laptop has wireless LAN and Ethernet. I'm currently using the wireless, the Wi-Fi. So tell it to use the wireless LAN. Capture everything up to a size of 1,500 bytes. And everything that, my, that this software captures, every message or packet that it captures, write into some file. CScapture.cap. So that's going to start a piece of software on my laptop that will record everything that my computer sends and receives. And then we'll look at that. I need my password to do it. You need administrator access to do such things on your computer. I typed in the wrong password. And now it's running. It says it's listening on the wireless LAN interface. It's capturing up to 15, 1,500 bytes. It doesn't show anything here because Everything now that my computer is sending or receiving is being written to this file, cscapture.cap. So now let's do something using the network. And the thing I'll do is I'll open my browser and instead of index.html, 
I'm visiting itsittuactch/cs.html, the page that I created on the server several minutes ago. Let's hope my internet works. Okay, my demonstration just failed because I haven't logged into SIT. Let's try this again. I'm going to stop this capture and start it again in a moment. It worked in my office, but not here. Let's log into the SIT internet first. Uh, I'm going to restart the capture. So I'm going to do this again, capture the packets. It's recording everything. My computer is sending and receiving. And now back to my web browser. I typed in the URL for cs.html. I had to log in to SIT's internet, which I forgot to do before. Log in. Please log in. Why aren't you working? OK, we got there. What is it showing? That's showing the web page that I created, the cs.html file. I put in some message, hello, everyone. I gave it a title, <coughs> test for CS, which is shown at the top of the tab here. So my browser has just accessed a web server. That's all. That's simple. Now we want to see what messages my computer sent to do that. How did it work? I'll stop my capture, just control C. It says that my computer, in that time between I starting and stop, captured 3,746 packets, messages. Only some of them are going to be relevant. They are stored in a file in some format. To look at them in some nice graphical interface, we use this program called Wireshark. And open the file. Wireshark, you can download for free, is available on most operating systems, Windows, Linux, Mac. Allows you to do this. You don't have to do this on the command line. Wireshark will do it for you. You just open it up and tell to capture. It shows the list of packets that were sent and received by my computer. I'll explain the structure of this in a moment, but well, just move things about. There are three parts to this window. I'll zoom in in a moment, but there are three parts. The, the top part lists packets. Lists packets sent and received by my computer. When we select a packet, um, currently the orange one is selected packet number one, some details of that packet are shown here in the second part. And the, the raw form of that packet is shown down the bottom. By the raw form, it's shown in hexadecimal. We'll see that later. I'm going to focus on the packet list. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit. And arrange a few things. There were 3,746 packets captured. They're all listed here. I can scroll down. A lot of them are not related to me accessing the web browser, a uh, web server. They're related to other things happening on the network. Your computer is usually doing something in the background, keeping track of its address, keeping track of other computers, and so on. I don't want to look at all those other packets. I only want to look at the web, web browsing packets. So I'm going to filter out some of those packets. Which ones? First, I'm going to filter out, the, filter out the packets which have my address in it. 
What is my address? I need to find out. Let's first find my, the address of my computer. The address of my wireless LAN interface that we're going to use, it has an internet address, or you probably know of an IP address. 10.10.99.251. So that's the address of my computer, my laptop at the moment. I want to filter out the packets that were captured which came from or went to this address. 10.10.99.251. We'll talk a little bit, there are a few more slides on addresses we'll come back to and then in a, another subject we'll go through the structure, what that address actually means later. But I'm sure you've seen such addresses before. 10.10.9.251. Two five one. Where's my capture? Here we are. I'm going to filter out any. I want everything that has an IP address of ten ten. Was it ninety nine two five one? That throws away some of those packets, so I just concentrate on, on a selection of them. I was using the application protocol HTTP. There are many packets here. I only want to concentrate on the web browsing part of it. So also filter such that only HTTP packets are shown. And now we start to see something that my web browser sent and received. And for this demo, there's, because I didn't log in at the start, there's a lot of these packets at the start. That is, this first one and all the subsequent ones, I think up to 1318, are to do with me logging into the SIT uh, internet system. I'm going to skip over them. They were not not supposed to be there. I was supposed to log in before. I'm going to scroll down to the one of interest. the orange one that I've selected. Let's just look at what it says. It's packet number 1318 in the sequence of packets I captured. From when I started the capture and captured the first packet, this was 37 seconds later. The source, that is the address that identifies the computer that sent this, i.e. my laptop, is 10.10.99.251. The destination, the address of the computer my laptop sent to, is 203.131.209.72. That turns out to be the IP address of the IT web server. The protocol used was HTTP. The length of this packet that was captured is 367 bytes. And some summary information about what's in this packet is a short message which is get slash cs.html using HTTP version 1.1. So this is the request from my browser to the web server requesting this file, the file in the direct the home or the root directory cs.html. When we select a packet in this list, details of it can be seen down here. So I'm going to look at some of the details. Just make some space here. And the way that Wireshark presents it is in a layered structure. From the, really from the, the lowest layer up to the highest layer. Let's see what happens. And we'll try and record it on the, script, on the board. We know that the application protocol I was using was HTTP. My web browser uses HTTP to communicate to uh, a web server. And we see that here, the hypertext transfer protocol. So the application protocol being used was HTTP in this instance. What my web browser did was created some, some data, 
to be sent. What was that data? If we expand that, we will see the data. We see the structure of this HTTP message. Let's draw it. In most packets that we send, we can distinguish between the data and the extra information, usually headers. So we may have some data and some headers. And in this case, with HTTP, in fact, all of that is included, uh, listed here. With HTTP, here's the get request, get slash cs.html. And then there's some extra information that is useful for your web browser to talk to a web server. The web browser tells the server some information about itself. My web browser is uh, Mozilla, Firefox. It's running on Ubuntu Linux, and the version of Firefox is listed there. So my web browser is telling the server some information about itself. Uh, what else? My web browser accept or prefers to accept languages I content in English. It can accept web pages which are compressed using gzip, or some compression of the web page. It wants to accept or it can accept in, or it prefers to accept HTML or XML as a response. This is the host or the name of the computer we're sending the request to, it.sit and so on. So these are really options or part of the header in the uh, HTTP GET request. So this is what's being sent by my web browser to the server. Maybe I'll draw it differently. Instead of headers and data, I'll simply draw it as the HTTP GET request. So the HTTP GET request is all of this. It's a request for my web browser to get this file, slash cs.html. So my application generates this message. My web browser does. If you look at the source code for your web browser, you'll see the code that generates such a message. HTTP generates this message. Then it sends that message to the next layer, the transport layer. Inside my computer, there are transport protocols in the operating system mainly. In this instance, the transport protocol used was TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. So what happened, my web browser created this GET request, sends it to the operating system, and inside the operating system there's, some, there's a component that implements TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. That's a transport protocol. What TCP does is takes the data that was received from HTTP, this, and adds some extra header information. And that's what all this lists. Uh, some, things, well, some things won't make much sense to us, but we can see that it adds some information about a source and destination. It says a port number. But really, this is identifying the source application and the source and the destination application. The source application is my web browser using number 42630. The destination application is a web server using number 80 or port 80. We haven't discussed the, the structure of the addresses yet. We will uh, talk about them later. And a bunch of other stuff. This is what we'd call header information. So how I'll draw that is that HTTP has the original GET request. It's sent to the TCP software that takes the GET request and adds some extra stuff to the, to the start of it. I'll say the TCP header, which really contains all this information. 
TCP does its work, it's a protocol, it follows some rules, and then sends it to the next layer down. And Wireshark presents it in the opposite order. The next layer is at the network layer, and the protocol used is IP. So, similar to TCP, it's a protocol, follows some rules, it takes what was sent from TCP and adds some extra information, the header. And again, a, a, a set of fields that are added to this message. We take this, all of it sent down to IP, and we add the IP header, where the values of the IP header uh, the version, IP version 4, which is the most common version of the internet protocol used today. The length of this part, 20 bytes in length. Some other fields, the total length of this, 353 bytes. Uh, and maybe things we'll recognize, the source address and the destination address. An address of the source computer on the internet, 10.10.99.251, my laptop and an address of the destination computer that we're sending this message to, 203-131-209-72. Yep? How does the browser know the destination So how, do, how does the browser know the destination address? That's something I've hidden from here. How does it know? Because, well, first, what did I do when I opened the web browser? I typed in it.sit. This is what I typed in. into the address bar of my browser. That's what I typed in. So as the user, I told the browser some address of a server. But I told it this domain name, it.sittuact.h. Somehow, magically, my computer has chosen the destination to be not it.sit, but 203.131.209.72. What happened before this, and in fact, it may not even be shown here because it happened in the cache on my computer, but what happened is that there's another protocol that converts domain names into IP addresses. What's the name of that protocol or system? DNS, the domain name system. That's the, the thing that given a domain name, some user-friendly address, something that you and I can remember, finds a computer-friendly address, that is an IP address. DNS allows us to remember human-friendly domain names, but really computers use IP addresses to communicate. And DNS really does the mapping. Given when I type this in, DNS goes to work and finds the corresponding IP address is this 203.131.209.72. So, yes, th this, in this case it's fixed. That is, DNS has its own set of servers that keep track of uh, the mapping from domain to IP address. So there are a set of servers in the internet that have a record or a database. This domain name maps to this IP address. So it's normally fixed. It can be changed. Yep. There's other servers on the internet taking care of this mapping of domain name to IP address. Computers, we think in the internet, computers or IP communicates using IP addresses. But us humans use domain names. So DNS provides a mapping from the domain names to IP addresses. Yeah. You can think that the user sitting up here, me, when I typed it in, I typed in the domain name, and, and it's hard to show here, I won't attempt to, but there's another protocol here as well. There's DNS. That also uses that. And that 
before HTTP goes to work, that goes to work and finds out, given that domain name, what is the IP address. And then it returns it to the, the browser and the, or the operating system, and then instead of using the domain name, we now use the IP address. Computers will use the IP address to communicate. So there's, at the network layer, we use the internet protocol. We have the information that came from the above layer, the transport layer, using TCP. And we've attached all this extra information, this header information, including the source and destination addresses. And that's graphically drawn here as the IP header. Next. And this is a little bit, or well, at least the names are a bit uh, confusing. But next is Ethernet. Ethernet is the general name for land-based protocols. Ethernet was the name for wired LANs. When I connect a cable into my laptop and connect into the wall, the protocol used is called Ethernet. But I'm using wireless LAN. Okay? That, I'm not using wired LAN. Why does it report here the next layer is Ethernet? Because in fact, wireless LAN is uh, very similar to Ethernet. Same standard, uh, standards organization has made it so that they are compatible. So this software reports that the message that was sent by my computer as being Ethernet, just a g the general name. But it was in fact sent via the wireless of my laptop, not via the wired LAN. Just that Wireshark refers to it, or it's referred to as an Ethernet frame. It's the same structure as a wired packet. So this is the data link layer. Wireshark reports it as Ethernet. Specifically, it's wireless LAN or Wi-Fi. And the same, we can expand that. And we see, we're running out of space here, we take everything from, that came from IP, and we add some header information, the ETH, the Ethernet header, and two things that it contains, it contains three things, two of them, it contains the source and destination address, and this is where it becomes confusing. This is the source and destination just for this link. Note that my laptop is communicating with a server which is, in fact, downstairs. There are multiple links between my laptop and the destination server. There's the link from my laptop to the access point. That's one link. Then there's a link from the access point from a cable to a switch downstairs. That's the second. And maybe one or two others eventually to the server. There are multiple links. The IP addresses 101, so on. They represent the endpoints, my laptop and the server. But when we get to the data link layer, we're communicating just across a single link. We have separate addresses which represent the endpoints of that link. So in this case, the source is my laptop, so my laptop has another address representing it on the wireless LAN, and the destination is this, why is it D-Link? Maybe I'm connected to a different access point. But the destination is this address of an access point. Let's draw that, or draw our network. Here's my laptop. Here's the access point on the wall. There's a wireless link between them. That's the IP address of my laptop. 
but the access point has a cable going to from it to some switch. We saw a small switch yesterday, probably downstairs on the third floor. And let's, for simplicity, I don't know the exact structure, but let's say that here is our server, the IT server. It's a computer downstairs on the third floor. And the address, 203, the IP address, 131209. The SIT network is more complex than this. There are more links. But just for simplicity, I'll, I'll draw it just as three links. One, two, three. Two cables, one is wireless. So this would just be one of the Ethernet cables, LAN cables that we saw yesterday, and another one. And here's just a PC, really. The network layer is used for communicating across the network, from my laptop to the destination server. So IP, the addresses used by IP are the network layer addresses, the 1010.99.251, and the server address, 203 address. But then my computer sends the data to the data link layer. And that's responsible for getting the data across a single link, the, the next immediate link. And in this case, we're using Ethernet, or specifically wireless LAN. And we see the addresses, these hexadecimal digits, 12 hexadecimal digits. The source address, don't look at the name here, focus on this, is the actual address, is 00265E8E. That's the address of the wireless LAN card inside my laptop. And it's communicating with ah, This is going to cause problems. It's not a switch, it's some other device. Let's not call it a switch. It's communicating via the wireless LAN to this device here. And if we find this device, I think you'll find it's, a, it's made by D-Link, and its address is 0050. BA, so on. That is this destination address. So, don't worry too much about the structure or format of those addresses, but the important point here is that we have two types of addresses. One that identifies our computer on the internet, or on the network, an IP address, and another address that identifies the computer on a link, that is just over the short distance. So, these strange hexadecimal addresses are identifying on a link, the IP addresses are identifying computers on a network. You will also find, if you uh, not in Wireshark, but you could also find that this access point has an address as well. But it's not shown in this software. We need some other software to do that. So, the data link layer is about communicating just across a local link. And then it gets to the end point of that link, and then that would send it onto the IT server. And they would have their own addresses of this format. That is, the IT server would have an address, similar structure to this. We don't know what it is. We do know its IP address, but we don't know its what we call hardware or MAC address or data link layer address. Can we see any other information? Now, one thing that's 
confusing or uh, not explained here is why do we use why do we see the address of this, this device and not the address of the access point? It's just the way that wireless LAN works. Wireless LAN treats the link, even though there's two links, a wireless link and a cable, the protocol treats the link as from laptop to this next device. So the way that wi wireless LAN works, it tries to pretend that we're on a wired network. It tries to make it look like from your laptop's perspective you're just attached to some other network, some other wired network. It just provides a wireless part here and then a wired part here. So from that's why we see the address of my laptop and this strange device somewhere downstairs. In fact, there's a, it goes via this access point here. We don't see the address of the access point. Let's see what else do we see. Then the software that I have that captured the packet shows that we have a frame, which is all of this, in fact. And it just gives us some summary information that in total now, all of this is 3, uh, 367 bytes in length. That's, it's just called a frame here. I call it a packet, sometimes it's a frame. That's the total length of this. This is then sent to the physical layer. And the software doesn't see what happens at the physical layer, that's in the hardware. The computer cannot see what the hardware is doing in this case. So the physical layer really receives these 367 bytes or 2,000 so on bits, receives them and converts those bits into some signal whatever it looks like, some radio signal in this case, and transmits some radio signal out of my laptop. So the physical layer is not seen in this software, but what it does is it takes these about 3,000 bits and converts it into some signal to be transmitted across the wireless link. And in fact, it's using the same protocol within many technologies, both the data link layer and the physical layer use the same set of protocols or uh, use the have the same name. It's called wireless LAN or Ethernet. That's just the request. This is sending, remember what we're doing, I typed in a, a domain name and slash cs.html into my browser and my browser sends this Sorry. My browser sends this HTTP GET request to the server. What we've done is drawn what happens inside my computer. Application creates the GET request, sends it to the operating system. We can think of approximately this is within the OS. This is Firefox. And approximately here is the hardware. My Firefox application created the request, sent it to the TCP part of the operating system, which put it inside or added a TCP header, did some processing, sends that to the IP part within the, op within the operating system. All of that is sent to the wireless LAN hardware on my laptop. And then all of that is eventually transmitted by the wireless LAN hardware as some signal to this access point. The access point receives receives a signal. We can think of the opposite direction now. Receives a signal, converts it back to bits, gets this frame, and then determines to send it on to the next device. So the laptop sends to the access point. The access point receives it, does some processing, sends it on to the next device, and that keeps happening until it's received by the IT server. And what the IT server does, I will not draw it, we'll see in a moment, receives some signal, converts the bits into some frame, realizes that the IT server is the destination, and removes the header. Uh, 
that is if we look going up now, removes the header and passes the contents to the IP software on the IT server, does the processing, removes the header, passes the contents up to TCP on the IT server now, removes the header, passes the contents up to the, not Firefox, but the web server application. And it turns out that on the IT server, the web server is Apache web server. It's just another piece of software running on other, another computer. And then the web server application has received the HTTP GET request. And when a web server receives a GET request, what does it do? What does it do? Web server receives a GET request, what does it do? Tries to find the, the presence of this cs.html file. If it exists, it sends back a response. Where's the response? So we just looked at the request. Here's the response, the next message in our, our capture. From 203.131.209.72, destined to my laptop, and the response, this is a summary information, 200 OK is some status code saying everything was OK. Here comes the file. And we see it has the same structure. It's Ethernet, IP, TCP, HTTP. And in the response is the actual file that we, requ we requested. And we can see it here. It says line-based text data, and down the bottom, here's the file. It's shown in hexadecimal here, but it's, it's given it in a convenient form of ASCII here. The HTML that I typed into the file is sent back from the web server to my laptop. So my computer receives this response. You can imagine it's received some signal. The Ethernet frame, then the IP datagram sends to TCP, eventually back to Firefox. Firefox receives this data, this, and then uses it to display something on my screen. That is, it takes the title, shows it as a title of the browser, and shows hello everyone on the screen. Any questions? Many things covered in that example. You have, I think, a diagram in your handouts, maybe on page slide 27, which sort of draws what I've drawn uh, on the board. So what we use this example to do is to illustrate how our computer processes data through the layers. The application generates some data, then it's sent to the next layer or a protocol within the next layer which processes, usually adds a header, sends it to the protocol in the next layer, and so on, until we send some signal. The computer that receives that does the opposite removes the headers, sends the contents up to the next layer until the original data is received by the uh, destination. Two messages shown there. Before I filtered based on my computer and also showing just the HTTP messages. If I remove those messages, that, that filter, uh, where's my computer gone? All right, my computer is dying. If it comes back, then what you'll see is that to get those, that request to the server and get the response back, we saw two messages, the request and response, 
but in fact there were many other messages sent. TCP, when it sends the data, okay, my Wireshark just crashed, when it sends the data, it I will not attempt to start it again. When TCP sends the data, in fact, it sends other messages to confirm that the data was received correctly. So there are many other packets sent to get that data successfully received. We'll see that when we look at the individual protocols. And we, one of the questions is about DNS. There's also DNS that happens. Let's try and summarize what we know so far by going back to the lecture notes. We've learned a little bit about HTTP, how it works, send a request, get a response. We've seen how data flows through a stack inside a computer when it's being sent and it comes back up when it's being received. We've seen some example protocols in use, TCP, IP, Ethernet or wireless LAN. And we've mentioned a little bit about addresses. IP addresses and these other addresses. Let's go back to the slides and see what we've missed uh, and talk a little bit more about addresses. This slide tries to capture what I've drawn here. I've drawn these as headers. You can add something at the end of the data. It's called a trailer and Ethernet does that in some cases. So this is the data then we add some extra information to the front of that, that's called a header, or we can add something to the end of it called a trailer. And then the physical layer we can think of has bits and creates some signal that's sent across the, the air in our case. But let's go back. I think we've covered the layers so we've seen an example of our protocol stack. This captures two links and the stacks in three different devices. Here's a source computer, say my laptop. Here's a destination computer, say the IT server. And imagine there's just two links, that is, there's one device in between them, not a wireless link, let's say a cable, for simplicity. Then from the point of view of the layering, my computer has protocols at each of these five layers, application through the physical. So does the destination computer, the server. But some of the intermediate devices in the network, switches, routers, other devices, they don't always implement all the layers. A router or a switch doesn't run applications. All that it does is forwards traffic on behalf of others. Same as this access point. It doesn't need to run a web server or a web browser. It just sits there, someone sends it data, it sends it to some, onto the next one. So the intermediate devices may not implement all of the layers. That's the point here. The end devices or the end hosts normally will uh, implement the entire stack, but the intermediate devices, for example routers, access points, switches, may implement just a, a selection, the lower layers, depending upon their role in the network. For example, in this case, my computer sends across one link, it's received by this intermediate device which is processed by the physical layer, the data link layer, and then the network layer sends it across the second link until it reaches the destination is passed up to the application layer. So some, and, and well, uh, the physical and data link layer are used across an individual link. The protocol used at this point and at this point should be the same. Same, the data link layer at the source host and this router should be the same. To communicate between these entities, they need to use the same protocol. If yesterday I used the protocol for Handshake and you used the protocol for Y, we would not be able to communicate correctly. OK? 
okay, would, if we follow different rules, we cannot communicate. So two entities that communicate must use the same protocol. And across the same link, or across a link, we use the same physical layer protocol, the same data link layer protocol. Across another link, we could use a different physical layer protocol here than here. This could be Ethernet, this could be using some optical fiber link. So the data link and physical layer are common across a link. They may be different across different links. So. The network layer is common across the network. For example, IP, the internet protocol. IP, IP. To communicate across the network, all of those devices need to use the same protocol. The transport and application protocols are common at the endpoints. The intermediate devices don't need to use those protocols. TCP and TCP, for example, HTTP and HTTP for the application protocol. So we differentiate between, uh, based on the devices, what set of protocols they may implement. Let's move on so we can try and finish up to the end of protocol architectures today. That just describes or tries to summarize the features of the five layers. We spoke about them yesterday and, and this, this morning. Uh, it lists some of the tasks of those five layers. We're focusing on this five layer TCP IP protocol architecture. There are others in the world. We've mentioned that in the past there was this OSI 7 layer architecture. It wasn't so popular. Okay? It didn't uh, become popular. And there are other older ones. IBM had their own. Apple had their own architecture. Novell had IPX. Again, these older ones have lost out to TCP IP. They've become less and less popular because all of the uh, organizations are now using TCP IP. But they exist still in, in, in some old networks. There are some architectures that are still that are used today and popular but only in specific domains. For example, in mobile phones. Your mobile phone, there's UMTS for 3G mobile communications. That specifies a protocol architecture that's different than the five layer architecture we've seen. And for fixed telephone systems, there's something called SS7. So there are others. But the primary one for general purpose use is this five layer stack that we use. We know what a protocol is set of rules for communicating entities to follow. Implemented in software, like in an application or in an operating system or in hardware. So depending upon what, what they're trying to achieve. What's a standard? A standard is an agreed upon set of rules by uh, some group normally of companies, of organizations. A set of protocols that some organization has agreed to use, usually multiple organizations. For example, all the manufacturers of mobile phones get together and agree that all of their mobile phones that they make will use the same set of protocols. What they do is they create a standard, usually some document that says, okay, this is the protocol we'll use and how we'll use it, and everyone agrees to follow the standard. And the benefit being is that one manufacturer, so long as they follow the standard, their phone will be able to talk to the other manufacturer's phone. So there's standards uh, are used for uh, allowing competition in the market. If we don't, if we have a proprietary protocol and not an open standard, then maybe there's just one manufacturer or one implementer. But if we have a standard which everyone can follow, we can have many manufacturers or many different implementations and we can have competition, uh, which is good for the end user in most cases. 
Of course, standards allow us to interoperate between countries. The fixed telephone. All the countries follow the same standards or some of the same standards for fixed telephone systems. So you can call someone in another country. What about mobile phones? Again, they follow the same standards that you can call someone in another country. In some cases, you cannot take your mobile phone to another country and expect it to work. There are different standards for mobile phones. There's the GSM type standards. In the US, in the past, they had different other than GSM, CDMA standards. That is, you couldn't take a CDMA phone and expect it to work in Thailand. It depends upon what uh, the internet or what the providers have implemented. But generally, standards allow us to interoperate across countries. There are different organisations that create standards. You don't need to remember all of them, but over this course, we'll see the acronyms come up. So just recognise that, OK, ISO, the International Organisation for Standardisation, is a standards organisation. They create standards, many different standards, some related to data communications. ITU creates standards for telecommunications. IEEE creates standards about electrical, electronic engineering, including data communications. I'll give some examples in a moment. IETF creates standards mainly for the internet. TCP and IP were created by the IETF. W3C, web-based standards like HTML, XML and so on. And there are others. A quick example. The IETF creates standards for internet protocols and they're called, what's, uh, they're called requests for comments or RFCs. This is the original IP standard, the internet protocol, September 1981. Although it was developed before them, it was originally written as a document here. It's just a text document which describes how IP works. 45 pages in length. And it has some description of what the internet protocol does, some background. We're not going to read it. You don't have to read it. There may be something we recognize here. It has some, it's a text document. That's how they draw their pictures. It represents a protocol stack, the application layer, transport, network, and then it says the rest, the local network protocols. So that's an example of the standard for the internet protocol. It's 45 pages, not so hard to read. What about another one? This is an example of a standard produced by IEEE. And this is the standard for called IEEE 802, which is the number of the standard series, dot 11, which is what technology? 802.11, Wi-Fi, wireless LAN. So my laptop communicating to the access point is using a stand or following a standard which has the name IEEE 802.11. And this is the document that describes the dot 11 part, the wireless LAN part. It's only 1,200 pages, so that's much more detailed. Uh, it specifies how do you transmit information across a wireless LAN. Uh, much more complex than how IP is described, for example. We will see some of the standards that uh, when we look at individual protocols later. Let's finish with a couple more examples or description of addresses. We need to identify computers in a network. So we, need a, we use an address to identify a computer. The same as we need to identify people in the country, we use their home address to identify where they are, to locate them. 
A computer, we can say, attaches to some network via a network interface. I didn't bring them today, but those LAN cards, let's say the network interface, the socket that we plug the cable in, that's our interface to the network. Same as the wireless LAN card in my laptop is the interface to the wireless network. How many interfaces does my lap laptop have? Anyone want to guess? How many network interfaces does my laptop have? Two or three, what are they? Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, Ethernet, the wired LAN, Bluetooth is another one. Mine doesn't have any more. So there's three network interfaces. Some may have a fourth, a mobile uh, 3G or GSM interface built in. Not so many, but some do. Your phone usually has a mobile communications interface plus a Wi-Fi plus a Bluetooth, maybe an NFC interface. So that's the attachment to the network we call the network interface. Within a single network, all computers must use the same addressing scheme. To be able to talk to someone on the same network as you, you need to know the format of the address that they're using. Within a single network, we refer to the address as the hardware address. Sometimes it's called a physical address, or a data link address, or a MAC address. We can think of it as the address at this point in our stack, either the physical layer or data link layer. We'll see it referred to as a hardware address. That's the address of your network interface piece of hardware. Your Bluetooth component has a hardware address. Your wireless LAN has a hardware address. Your 3G has a hardware address. and your Ethernet wired LAN has a hardware address. Different addresses. There are different schemes for specifying an address, a hardware address. The most common one we will see is what's called an IEEE 48-bit address. This is an IEEE 48-bit address. It's in fact 12 hexadecimal digits which is equivalent to 48 bits because a hexadecimal digit from 0 to 15 can be converted into a 4-bit number. So it's actually a 48-bit length address. There are others. There are some 64-bit addresses and, and different ones. But the one, main one we will see is the 48-bit address. They are used for local area networks and wide area networks. Across a larger network, like the internet, we have an additional address called a logical address or a network address. And the specific type that is well, used in the internet is an IP address. But there are two types of IP addresses. The main one used today, because we use IP version 4, is a 32-bit address. In the future, and it's in use a little bit today, is the next version, IP version 6, which has a 128-bit address, a longer address. In this course, we're going to focus on IP version 4. So it turns out most network interfaces, well, all network interfaces will say will have a hardware address. Those network interfaces that are attached to the internet also have an IP address. And to finish, Let's look at my laptop. To look at my interfaces, I can use ifconfig. To look at... Scrolls down. Sorry. Let's scroll up a bit. I have three interfaces on my laptop, and they, the configuration of those interfaces are listed here. They, the operating system gives them a name, ETH0, LO, WLAN0. LO is a special one. It's not a real interface. It's a virtual interface. Let's ignore it for now. But I have my Ethernet interface for my wired LAN. It has a hardware address, 0024, so on. And I have my wireless LAN interface for my Wi-Fi network. It has a separate hardware address, 
00265E, so on, this one here. And because my wireless, my laptop is connected to the internet via the wireless LAN interface, it also has an IP address, an internet address, 10109951. I don't have a cable plugged into my wired LAN. I haven't connected to the network or, and obtained an IP address from my Ethernet interface, just for the wireless LAN. If I plugged a cable in, I may get an IP address also for ETH0, and it would be different from this. We're out of time. What you'll do over the next week is not only you'll do two quizzes, but you'll also uh, have a look at the addresses of your computers, your mobile phones, your laptops, your home computers. Find the addresses, both the hardware addresses and the IP addresses, and learn uh, how to find them and note the difference between them. Next week we'll continue, we'll finish this uh, briefly about addresses and then look at some performance metrics and we'll be on to the next topic.